Senate will come to order. I ask everyone present to please rise and repeat with me the Pledge of Allegiance to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our invocation today will be given by the Most Reverend Edward B. Scharfenberger, the Bishop of the Diocese of Albany. Bishop Scharfenberger. God of goodness and mercy, ever present, ever kind, we seek your truth and guidance. Clear our wits and enlighten our consciences so that our every thought, word, and action may be for the good of all we serve. As your sun shines on all your creatures, so too may our actions and deliberations be directed not by individual gain, but by the demands of justice and right, with trust in the truth of your love for all, without regard for worldly status or position. Help us to be good and faithful public servants. Bless us and all the people of our empire state. May we lead as well by example. In your holy name, amen. We thank you, Bishop Scharfenberger, from the Roman Catholic Diocese of Albany. The chair will now hand down a message from the State Board of Elections, being the official certification of duly elected members of the Senate, and directs that the same be filed. So handed down and so ordered. I would now like to ask if there is any senator who is present who has not taken their oaths of office to please rise. Well done. <laughs> the secretary will call the roll to ascertain a quorum. Senator Dabo. Senator Amador. Senator Avella. Senator Bonasek. Senator Boyle. Senator Breslin. Senator Carlucci. Senator Comrie. Senator Croce. Senator DeFrancisco. Senator Diaz. Senator Dillon. Senator Espeat. Senator Farley. Senator Felder. Senator Flanagan. Senator Funky. Senator Gallivan, Senator Gionaris, Senator Golden, Senator Griffo, Here. Senator Hamilton, Here. Senator Hannon, Here. Senator Hassel Thompson, Here. Senator Hoyleman, Senator Kennedy, Here. Senator Klein, Here. Senator Kruger, Here. Senator Lanza, Here. Senator Larkin, Here. Senator Latimer, Senator Laval, Here. Senator Libis. We have achieved the quorum. The Senate has a quorum present. Senator Libis. President, uh, Mr. President, there is a resolution at the desk by Senator Young. Uh, I would ask that the resolution be read and that it be moved for its immediate adoption, please. The Secretary will read. Senate resolution by Senator Young providing for the election of Dean G. Skelos as temporary president of the Senate for the years 2015-2016. The resolution is before the House. Senator Gennaris, why do you rise? Uh, Mr. President, I believe there's a substitute resolution at the desk. I ask that you read the title and move for its immediate adoption, and I ask for the opportunity to be heard. There is a substitution before the death. The secretary will read. Senate resolution by Senator Giannaris providing for the election of Andrea Stewart Cousins as temporary president of the majority lead, as majority leader of the Senate for 2015-2016. Chair recognizes Senator Giannaris for remarks. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, and happy new year to you and all my colleagues. Uh, two years ago, uh, my conference uh, formally recognized uh, as a leader Andrea Stewart Cousins, uh, but of course that was only uh, formal because she has been a leader her whole life. Uh, and has led by example uh, in some of the, in her personal story and the great success she's had, has led as a local official uh, on issues of civil rights and protecting the people of Westchester. 
uh, and of course has led here uh, among us in the Senate chamber uh, for the last several years, uh, the last two of which has been as the leader of our conference. Uh, and in that role, uh, she has brought great credibility to uh, the Democratic Conference. She has brought uh, great uh, reputation for integrity to the Democratic Conference. Uh, and in fact, she has been a leader without being the majority leader over the last two years uh, and helping uh, move this state forward on, on so many issues. Uh, and I would submit to my colleagues that uh, she is incredibly well equipped. The election, as everyone knows, would be historic since we've never had a female uh, majority leader in either chamber uh, in the New York State. Uh, and I think she would serve us well uh, as a leader of our entire body. And so, Mr. President, I ask my colleagues uh, to support this substitute resolution, which provides for the election of Andrea Stewart Cousins as temporary president and majority leader for this coming session. Thank you, Senator Gennaris. On the substitute resolution offered by Senator Gennaris, all those in favor will signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Aye. The resolution fails. Senator Velasky, why do you? <laughs> Thank you, Senator Diaz. <laughs> Senator Velasky, why do you rise? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. President. We have some order in the chamber, please. We have a lot of people here and a lot of business, and it's great to have everybody here today, but I would ask for some order and decorum so we may hear the members. Senator Velasky, you may continue. Th Thank you, Mr. President. I believe there is another uh, substitute resolution at the desk. I ask that the reading of that resolution be waived and uh, have the opportunity to speak on that. Secretary will read. Senate resolution by Senator Valeski, providing for the election of Jeffrey D. Klein as temporary president and majority leader of the Senate for 2015-2016. Senator Valeski on the resolution. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I'd like to just take a few moments uh, this afternoon as we reconvene and, and come together in this new Senate uh, to do the people's business, to talk uh, first, though, about a friend of mine, a colleague of mine, a colleague of really all of ours here in, uh, in the Senate uh, chamber, someone who I've been uh, proud to not only call a colleague but a friend, and that is uh, Senator Jeff Klein. Jeff, as many of you know who have worked uh, with him over the years, certainly one of the hardest working, most tenacious and dedicated public servants. The years that we have worked together, I've always been impressed with the energy that he has shown, the drive that he shows, the passion for public service that he brings to work each and every day, not only for the residents of his Senate district, but for all 19 and a half million New Yorkers. You know, a few years back, uh, he and I and uh, a handful of other colleagues here today uh, discussed the idea of forming a new conference, an independent conference, an independent democratic conference. Uh, I had shared Jeff's frustration at the time that the work we were elected to do as senators was being, in many ways, hijacked by a hyper-partisan bickering and gridlock, and I certainly gave him my full support as leader of an independent conference. And in the past four years under Jeff's leadership, the IDC has proven time and again to be a strong, sensible, stable force for governing in the Empire State. Our conference under Jeff's leadership has bridged and helped to form a lasting bridge of the political divide that once paralyzed this legislative body. And we have put forth dozens of common sense policies and proposals that have been signed into law by Governor Cuomo and that have made a meaningful difference in people's lives. This year is no different. Anyone who knows Jeff knows that he is a true student of history and our New Deal for New York package on how to smartly invest the $5 billion in financial settlement monies was his brainchild. A page from the past, a Roosevelt-inspired plan that can be put to practice today to create thousands of good-paying jobs, and we'll certainly have an opportunity to discuss that further, uh, further, I'm sure, as the session continues. And that, in essence, is what Jeff and Jeff's leadership is all about, putting smart, common-sense ideas forward that lift up and empower the New York worker, that support our families, that provide for our seniors, that care for our children, that preserve our neighborhoods, that fight for our communities, and that create a better quality of life for all New Yorkers. He is relentless in setting goals and in finding ways to achieve them. No one has their eye on the ball or their ear to the ground as Jeff Klein. Whether at a senior center in Morris Park in the Bronx, a community meeting in Riverdale, or knee-deep in budget talks, Jeff Klein is always 100% committed to his job and to serving the people of the state of New York. And I can honestly say that I have never seen anyone fight harder, work longer, 
or be more invested than Jeff Klein. And as a result, Mr. President, I pr proudly stand here uh, in support uh, the nomination of Jeff Klein as temporary president of the Senate. Thank you. Th thank you, Senator Bolesky. The question is on a sub substitute resolution offered by Senator Bolesky. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Yes. The resolution fails. On the resolution before the House, the Senate uh, chair recognizes Senator Young. Thank you, Mr. President. It truly is a deep honor and a privilege to rise to nominate the temporary president of the New York State Senate. The people of New York State need to have a Senate leader who is a tireless worker, someone who listens and takes action, someone who understands what New Yorkers face in their everyday lives, the trials and the tribulations, the joys and the sorrows, the hopes and the dreams, the aspirations for a brighter future for themselves and for their families. We need someone who has the courage to make the difficult decisions, someone willing to give his strength to others and inspire others to do great things. The person I am nominating today has not only earned the trust of his fellow Senate colleagues, but his legacy is one of public service and accomplishments on behalf of all New Yorkers. This leader learned his work ethic early on during his childhood, working in a small business alongside his family members in a bakery. Like other families, they faced heartaches and hardships, yet this leader went on to achieve a distinguished record both academically and professionally. In this chamber, he fought for senior citizens as chair of the Committee on Aging and led the way for the adoption of Megan's Law to protect our children from repeat sex offenders. He has strengthened education and learning for our young people and has strived to create jobs and economic growth for families all across New York State. His focus on families is rooted in his deep love for his own family, and his greatest joy is being a father and a grandfather. That is why he believes profoundly in accomplishing public policy that will give everyone the opportunity to succeed. One of our founding American presidents, John Quincy Adams, said, quote, if your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, you are a leader. We are fortunate to have a leader who possesses all of these remarkable qualifications. I am proud to nominate Senator Dean G. Skelos as temporary president of the New York State Senate. Thank you, Senator Young. The question is on the resolution before the House. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The resolution is carried. Congratulations, Senator Skelos. I would ask that Senator Skelos please come forward. He will be sworn in today by his brother, the New York State Justice of the Supreme Court, Peter Skelos. He will be joined, and we're very honored to have in the chamber today, his father, Basil, as well as his wife, Gail, and son, Adam. Welcome, and it's an honor and privilege to have you all here. Senator Judge Skelos. Thank you. 
Majority is the temporary president of the New York State Senate. Temporary president of the New York State Senate. To the best of my ability. To the best of my ability. So help me God. So help me God. Senator Libis. Thank you, Mr. President. I believe there's a resolution at the desk, and I ask that its uh, title be read and we move for its immediate adoption uh, for the election of the Secretary of the Senate. Secretary will read. Senate resolution by Senator Skelos that Francis W. Patience of Latham, New York, be and he hereby is elected Secretary of the Senate for the years 2015 2016. The question is on the resolution before the House. All in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? It's unanimous. <laughs> the resolution is adopted. Mr. Mr. Patience will now be sworn in by our temporary president, Senator Dean Skelos. Senator Skelos. Before I swear, I want to say what a special person he is. Everybody, everybody in the Senate can all set. Whether you're a Republican conference, Democrat conference, I mean, chief conference, he treats everybody as with the respect of what he deserves. I'm very proud to be able to serve you. Please uh, raise your right hand and repeat after me. I do solemnly swear. I do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of New York and the Constitution of the State of New York. And that I will faithfully discharge the duties. And that I will faithfully discharge the duties of the office of Secretary of the Senate of the State of New York. Of the office of Secretary of the Senate of the State of New York, according to the best of my ability. Congratulations, Mr. Patience. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator at, Libis. At this time, I would like to hand up the following resolution and ask that the title be read. And I would ask that we move for its immediate adoption, please. The resolution is before the desk, and the Secretary will read. Senate resolution by Senator Skelos to adopt the rules of the Senate for the years 2015 2016. Senator Squadron, why do you rise? Thank you. If I could ask the sponsor of the resolution a few questions, Mr. President. Senator Hannon, do you yield? Thank you. Happy New Year to sponsor, President, all assembled. Uh, before we adopt these rules, I think it's critical that we uh, engage a little bit in an understanding of them. Unfortunately, the Senate Democratic Conference did not receive them even 24 hours before uh, we are now voting on them and adopting them uh, over the course of this session, which is uh, certainly disappointing, uh, a disappointing way to begin, but uh, I, nonetheless, I think it's important that we do discuss these, so I hope the sponsor forgives me up front if any of these questions are immediately apparent to anyone who has had more than a couple of hours to look at these rules. But uh, I point the sponsor to Rule 7, uh, where I think in new language that we've never seen in any prior rules before this body, uh, we see in the second paragraph of Rule 7, Section 1, that uh, the temporary president, in consultation with the independent Democratic Conference leader, shall refer bills or designate an officer to refer bills to the appropriate standing committee. 
bill shall be referred in accordance with a set of guidelines we publish annually, et cetera, to the end of that paragraph, if the sponsor sees that paragraph. And uh, the sponsor would just sort of speak to what the purpose of that is, this consultation between uh, the temporary president and the leader of the Independent Democratic Conference is new. If the sponsor could speak to how uh, those who drafted these rules see that playing out. I Senator Hannon. I think the overall purpose <coughs> of these rules is to reflect the results of the election last November and to reflect the realities of uh, coming together with the majority coalition the Republicans and the IDC, and to try to provide for, uh, as best one can do in black and white, uh, decision-making process as to um, how this chamber will be run, how we will proceed with the business for the people of the state of New York. So there is, throughout these rules, references um, to uh, the majority coalition, to the IDC, um, and to try to reflect that. And if the sponsor will continue to yield. Senator Yannon, do you yield? Senator yields. Uh, and uh, in particular, throughout these rules, again, as we've re reviewed them quite quickly here at the 11th hour, we've seen this word in consultation. And I, I just love some further understanding of, of uh, how that's seen and, and the purpose of that, how that will play out. I would simply say that it would have its common sense meeting, meaning and uh, to have uh, one uh, officer uh, consult with the other. The sponsor I, don't think I don't think there's any other special meaning that one can attribute to it, and it would be the idea of moving uh, uh, the legislation forward in this chamber. The sponsor will continue to yield. Yes. Sponsor yields. Um, uh, we see it occur, we see this, this consultation between the two leaders uh, occur in Rule 7, second paragraph, uh, in uh, Rule 7 still, uh, in Section 5. Uh, which has to do um, with, with the dates on which resolutions are, are uh, in order in uh, paragraph 9, like section 9, excuse me, of Rule 7, um, which has to do with uh, uh, who sort of is determining which resolutions are in order. Uh, we see it in the final section of Rule 7, which is also 9, in paragraph E, which is uh, uh, having to do with sort of whether uh, uh, the coalition leaders deem resolutions to be proper. We see it again in Rule 8, um, having to do, and again, forgive me, because this is all very new to us. My, my sheet is not quite warm, but nearly, um, uh, in sort of how the, the minutes of meetings are distributed. Is that fair to say? Is that, that's, that's a fair analysis. Have, have I missed any of the, con of the consultative rules? Well, you seem to have read the rules pretty well. Thank you. Um, <laughs> this is basically what we've always had. This does put into uh, print a partnership between the co uh, members of the coalition. Uh, nothing more and nothing less. Uh, great. And is it, if the sponsor will continue to yield? Yes. Sponsor yields. Uh, and is it fair to say that, that these are sort of some of the uh, uh, functions of the House that have to do with uh, the sort of nonpartisan ministerial functions of the House, very, very important ones, by the way, I would point out. Um, uh, as, as you know, I believe that the way the rules are uh, written and then enacted is the core uh, 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 tool that we use to be able to help our constituents and improve the state. And so. I, I, I certainly think these are important features, but it's fair to say they're ministerial ones, largely. I'm not going to get into any of those characterizations. These are basically the rules that we as a Senate for many, many years have used. We've tried to move things forward. We've tried to be fair to all sides and all views, give people fair hearing. Um, and to the extent that one uh, ever has to adjust for circumstances, you try to do that. But this is, the expectation is uh, what we have done in the past continues as a spirit for the future. Uh, thank you very much. On the resolution. Senator Squadron, on the resolution. Uh, and I appreciate that description. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, better understand these rules. I, you know, I think that something that uh, was clear in, in what Senator Hannon said in describing them is talking about a partnership, talking about the, I think he used the phrase, the common sense definition of consultation, which I believe is collaborative. and 
and in working together. I support those things. Uh, personally, I think that's a very positive way to write rules, and those are uh, things that we should have in the Senate rules, and, and I understand uh, that, that they are here for two of the three conferences. The question that I would ask is uh, why, especially on these sorts of functions, we wouldn't have that same level of consultation and collaboration with all three conferences. Uh, I, I think that when you talk about uh, who's determining what committees bills get introduced to, when you're talking about issues like occurred with me last year where I had a bill that had properly been introduced into a committee, had properly had a motion for committee consideration introduced and ended up getting pulled by the Rules Committee uh, based on, on no clear guide, guidelines or guidance, I think a more bipartisan, fairer process is exactly what we need. And, and so uh, the fact that it's being written into the rules here, uh, I think uh, it raises a, an important question, which is why couldn't, for these functions especially, all three conference leaders be consulted? Why couldn't uh, we have a process? Obviously, uh, the number of votes in the House or the number of votes in the House, but where uh, uh, the Democratic conference leader, Senator Stuart Cousins, is also consulted and also brought to the table on these questions. It seems to me that's the kind of legislative body where all of our 19 million constituents, where uh, everyone in the state, whether they happen to have elected uh, a member of the Democratic or the Independent Democratic or the Republican conference, uh, would have a real say in uh, how we're organizing ourselves and running ourselves. So to me, what's striking is the absence of the Democratic conference leader uh, in these rules and in this consultation. I, I think that, uh, as Senator Hannon said, uh, there shouldn't be anything new to the concept of consultation. There, uh, we know that, uh, that uh, these are, are uh, f features and functions that have been run in this House for a long time. Uh, but I think it's disappointing that we don't have a House that uh, lives up to what Senator Griffo and Senator Bonasek called for in the minority report of the Valesky Committee that I was proud to sit on uh, in 2009, which is a truly nonpartisan uh, functioning of uh, many of these features, one in which the majority and minority conferences, we only had two at the time, but whether we have three or four conferences or however many, all have an ability to uh, be part of these things so that we don't see the sorts of shenanigans that uh, a very important bill that I sponsor was victim to last year that I think we all know, if we were being honest with ourselves, uh, when we look in the mirror, have too often plagued this house. And so uh, I, I find that, that rule change to be a, sort of a, a, a glimmer of potential sunlight that we don't quite get to dawn on today. And I think that's a real shame, and I would urge uh, an amendment of the rules to include all three conference leaders in those features where two are now included. Uh, certainly, it would lead to a more robust democracy, a fairer, better structured House. The other point I want to make on these rules very briefly is I see that uh, Senator Rules continues to exist. Uh, every bit as vibrantly as ever. We have a whole number of new senators this year, and I welcome all of you. Uh, it is a great honor to serve with you, and I know for you as for me, a great honor to represent your constituents in this House. Um, you may not know that you are joining a 64th senator, Senator Rules, who under these rules, and, and in fairness many in the past, has the power to uh, refer bills to itself, uh, has the power to grab bills from any other committee and uh, do as Senator Rules, he or she, I'm not certain, uh, deems fit. Uh, and uh, it, it's uh, something that has, uh, as I think many of my colleagues know, frustrated me for a long time. But it's also something that really gets to the core of who we are as a legislative body. Because really what Senator Rules is, is a way to break all the other rules. And what Senator Rules is, is a way to undermine the entire committee process, the entire process of open debate, uh, the process whereby not nearly sufficiently, but whereby there is some ability for minority members, uh, every member of a committee, to have a say in what happens on that committee. And the powers given to Senator Rules, and in fact slightly expanded this year from two years ago, uh, fundamentally undermine that. An enormous percentage of all of the bills that we pass this year aren't going to be seen by any of our committees, ranked by the minority members, chaired by the coalition, majority members, they're going to, at the end of the year in the last two weeks, 
get pulled to Rules Committee agendas that are thicker than the pad on my desk. They are gonna pass in about 10 seconds flat and they will never get the kind of due consideration and conversation that I know Senator Nazzolio and I uh, were pleased to and had the opportunity to, to great credit of Senator Nazzolio, deal with on the Codes Committee in the last two years that I know Senator Kruger and Senator DeFrancisco have on the Finance Committee. So many of my other colleagues have in collaborative relationships, consultative relationships with uh, their chairs. And the fact that the rules of Palooza at the end of session will continue again this year without any uh, uh, change won't just undermine what happens at the end of session, but is gonna undermine the committee process throughout the session. And you know, this committee process really is the last bastion of uh, bipartisanship of collaboration that we have. And so what that means is that the ability for every senator to speak up on behalf of their constituents, on behalf of their colleagues from their side of the aisle is being undermined by the fact that Senator Rules, with all of the turnover we've had, unfortunately continues in this House and continues in uh, his or her robust, strengthened leadership position. So I would also urge that we go back on, the, on that rule and that we change Rules of Palooza so that the Rules Committee doesn't uh, trump every other committee for the last three weeks of session and so that the Rules Committee no longer has the ability to act like a senator without any of the accountability or transparency that all the rest of the senators, all the rest of the bills must undergo. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Squadron. Senator Kruger. Mr. President, would the sponsor please yield to some questions? Senator Hannon, do you yield? I'll yield to a question. Thank you. Um, can the sponsor tell me the ratio percentage breakdown in this session of actual Democratic caucus conference members, Republican conference members, and IDC members by percentage? I don't have that at hand. For you, Mr. President, if I could answer that question and then do a follow-up question. You may speak on a resolution, Senator Kruger. Oh, well, I'll, all right, on the resolution, for the record, um, the Democratic Conference is 39.7 or 40% of the Senate. The Republican Conference is 47.6 or 48% of the Senate, and the IDC is 7.9 or 8% of the Senate. Uh, through you, Mr. President, if the sponsor would continue to yield. Senator Hannon, do you yield? Yes. Senator Sponsor yields. Thank you. Can the sponsor tell me within the rules what percentage of resources each conference is to receive? It's set forth someplace. Um, Page 28. Uh, if you know the answer, why don't you suggest it? Read it. Would you like to comment, Senator? Thank Kruger? you. Through you, Mr. President, to answer my own question. In Section 8 on page 28, it references the Democratic Conference shall not receive less than 30% of the funds allocated, which would assume the other 70% goes to uh, the Republican and IDC Conference. It, there does not show a breakdown between the two. And in Section 11, it shows that the Democratic Conference receives 29% of the community projects resources, even though we are 40% of the Senate. If the sponsor would continue to yield. Sponsor yields. I did pretty well on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Through you, Senator Mr. Kruger. President. Why is there such a disproportionate distribution of resources compared to the actual elected members of the Senate? Well, there's two reasons in response. There are a lot of administrative duties that go into running the Senate. There's questions of printing. There's questions of engrossing. There's pre questions of revision. There's questions of running uh, the, the uh, technical part of the Senate in terms of the, the computers. We have sergeant at arms. We have elevators that have to be uh, operated. We have maintenance and operations. That's, that goes there. It's an enormous amount. It's a costly. It's a costly uh, amount. And the second part is, this is a number that was in last year's rules too. 
So it's not changed. It's not. Through you, Mr. President, if the sponsor would continue to yield. Yes, sponsor yields. Thank you. Um, in the committee section of the rules, there is a formula for determining <coughs> membership on committees. I'm sorry, I'm just hold finding the page. Um, I think it's page 18. But the formula for determining membership on committees actually states yes, that when you're calculating the members, which are supposed to be a proportionate share of representation in the Senate, you round up if it's a Republican or IDC member of the Senate, and you don't round up if it's a decimal point with a Democratic member of the committee. Can the sponsor help me understand why we are less than a full person when the other members of the Senate are treated as, in a formula as full people. <clears throat> it's a very simple mathematical thing. You can't round up everybody. You can only round up one number. If you rounded up everybody, then you'd be into the next number. Through you, Mr. President, you of course could round up everybody. You might end up with a member number on the committee that is slightly larger or slightly smaller, whichever direction you choose to go, but I don't actually see any even um, example from a, another legislature in this country where some party members are rounded down and other party members are rounded up. First of all, no one's being rounded down. The second thing is we're trying to run the Senate in an orderly process. During the course of any legislative session, people join committees, leave committees, switch committees, et cetera, and there, there needs to be some general idea of what we're going. Um, I don't believe there's been any problems in the past, and uh, it's something that has to be looked at when the membership changes or when people desire to move to another committee. Three, Mr. President, on the bill. Senator Kruger on the resolution. Thank my colleague for answering questions, or mostly not answering questions, but allowing me to ask and answer the questions. I wanted to highlight that he's right. This is very much like the previous rules, and even other than a third caucus, like the previous rules and the previous rules and the previous rules. The problem is, for those of us who have been in this austere Senate chamber for more than a few session beginnings, most of us know, and the state knows, that the Senate rules are broken, that they do not allow for a rational, democratic, small d model of government, that they offer disproportionate control to one party over the other, that we don't, as my colleague Senator Squadron already highlighted, have a robust committee structure that allows for bills to have hearings, have serious debate with public participation, allow for amendments to bills to be changed when there are contributions to be made to improve legislation, for a process that allows rank and file members to overrule a leader to get a bill to the floor. It's been documented in report after report. My colleague referenced a bipartisan report of this Senate chambers from several years ago. And if one goes back to that report as I did today, you'll see we are basically not making any of the changes recommended within that bipartisan report. We continue to have disproportionate distribution of funds to provide services within our conferences for our constituencies, constituencies and in fact, in the distribution of monies to districts that is also disproportionately unequal in that 40% of the Democrats, excuse me, 40% of the Senate are the actual Democratic conference and they'll be receiving 29% of the funds for distribution to their constituents, which is equally unfair as is the structure of the rules. Now, I also want to agree with my colleague when Senator Squadron pointed out the rules about 
having, conferring with, are all perfectly acceptable. One can view them as meaningless or meaningful as you wish, but what I don't understand is why wouldn't we be conferring with 40% of the Senate through the actual Democratic Conference and Majority Leader Andrea Stewart-Cousins. I read in an article, some of us might have also read it, where one of my Republican colleagues was talking about wanting to show respect for the IDC. Don't you think it would be good if we had respect for everyone in this chamber, Mr. President? Don't you think our rules should reflect equal respect for all of us, each other, regardless of what conference we sit in? Our rules do not re reflect this concept of respect. And frankly, it's the first day of session, and the year will go on, and there'll be an opportunity for people to perhaps rethink the statements they're making. Um, but I actually would like to serve in a chamber where we can all respect each other and expect equal respect from each other, not some formula of respect or lack of respect based on the title that goes next to our name in our conference. So I do oppose these bills, Mr. President, and I would urge my colleagues to vote no, because not only do I know we could do better, all 63 of us know we can do better, and those of us who have been around a few years are even on record having said that in the past, and I hope somewhere they remember they said that, they might even believe it. So I'll be voting no on these rules, Mr. President. Thank you. Senator Hannon. Uh, <clears throat> I just want to have a couple of comments. I, um, I think most of uh, what Senator Squadron was talking about at the end could be avoided if all of the uh, members of this House got their bills finished, amended, reported out early. If governors and uh, agencies got their bills and comments out early. Uh, unfortunately, we do have a lot of work at the end, but if we could ever reverse that, that would be the best thing. It has nothing to do with uh, those of us who just got elected. Um, I believe in the assembly, they go through the same problems. So the idea is to have an open process, a responsible process, a process that operates on a bipartisan basis. All of our rule committees are open. We actually have rule committee meetings. They're all uh, webcast. They're, they're open to anybody, member of the public. Um, that's not the case in the other house. Um, so the, the accountability and transparency is there, and this has been done um, with bills that are mem sponsored by members of the Democratic Party, the IDC, the Republican Party, and we're all trying to move forward. Um, I don't believe that you can just start to talk about some of these minor things that have been there that were the exact same provisions when the Democrats were in the majority, and now you're complaining about them. So we're trying to be fair. We're trying to have a, an excellent house. We're trying to have a good product for the people in New York, and I think this is a good construct that we have before us today. Thank you, Senator Hannon. The question is on the resolution before the House. All in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Aye. The resolution is adopted. Senator Libis. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, there's another resolution at the desk. I ask the title be read, and we move for its immediate adoption in appointing a sergeant at arms. Secretary will read. Senate resolution by Senator Skelos that Stephen F. Slagan, being he hereby is elected sergeant at arms, for the Senate for the years 2015-2016. Question is on the resolution. All in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The resolution is adopted. Congratulations, Sergeant Slagan. <laughs> I know the sergeant has been practicing his clapping, so. Senator Libis. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, there's another resolution at the, the desk. I ask that its title be read, and we move for its immediate adoption in appointing uh, the Senate stenographer. Secretary will read. Senate resolution by Senator Skelos that Catherine Kirkland be and she hereby is elected the official stenographer of the Senate for the years 2015-2016. The question is on the resolution before the House. All in favor signify by saying aye. Opposed? The resolution is adopted. Senator Libis. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I uh, hand up another resolution that's at the desk and ask that the 
title be read and move for its immediate adoption as we set forth the hours of the Senate. The resolution has been handed up and the Secretary will read. Senate resolution by Senator Skelos providing for the hours of meeting by the Senate for the years 2015-2016. Question is on the resolutions. All in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The resolution is adopted. Mr. Libis. Again, Mr. President, I have another resolution uh, uh, before the desk. I ask that we uh, read it and um, read the title and move for its immediate adoption. The Secretary will read. Senate resolution by Senator Skelos resolved that the temporary president appoint a committee of three to inform the governor of the election of Dean G. Skelos as temporary president of the Senate for the years 2015-2016 and that the Senate is organized and ready to proceed with business. The question is on the resolution before the House. All in favor signify by saying aye. Opposed? The resolution is adopted. Mr. President. Senator Libis. Thank you, sir. I believe there is a, another resolution at the desk. Uh, may we please have it read and move for its immediate adoption. Secretary will read. Senate resolution by Senator Skelos resolved that the temporary president appoint a committee of three to wait upon the assembly and inform that body of the election of Dean G. Skelos as temporary president of the Senate for the years 2015-2016, and that the Senate is organized and ready to proceed with business. The question is on the resolution before the House. All in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The resolution is adopted. Senator Libis. Uh, Mr. President, at this time, would you please call on Leader Stewart Cousins for uh, remarks, please? Senator Stewart Cousins. Thank you, Mr. President. And I want to say uh, welcome back and, and Happy New Year to all of my colleagues. And I also want to thank my family for being present as always, uh, because we all know sitting in this chamber that the presence of our family and their support is what makes us able to do what we do. I obviously want to thank my constituents for allowing me to continue to represent the 35th District. And of course, I want to thank my colleagues my wonderful colleagues who have humbled me and, and honored me with the opportunity to be your leader for this session. I want to welcome uh, some of our new members so that you'll get an opportunity, hopefully, to meet everyone. But joining our conference is Senator Leroy Comrie from Queens. Uh, Senator Comrie uh, is a former council member and former deputy borough president of Queens and of course a real leader in the community. So we are very, very happy that you have joined us. Uh, also in the same row is Senator Jesse Hamilton. And, uh, Senator Hamilton is actually a former a staffer for uh, now Borough President Eric Adams. But uh, he's an attorney, he's an MBA, and he's a longtime community activist. And we are so happy that you are with us. And very finally, last but not least, Mark Panapinto from the Buffalo area. Another great uh, longtime activist and a Buffalo area attorney. So uh, we are very, very happy to have our three newest members and, of course, equally happy to have our returning members who are such uh, wonderful champions and such great representatives of all that New Yorkers need and all that we are about. I'd also like to, while I'm congratulating, I'd like to congratulate Senator Klein, who's been reelected as his uh, conference leader and certainly in your role here. And I want to take a, an opportunity to congratulate uh, Senator Skelos. You have an awesome task of leading this great house. And uh, I just want you to know that the Senate Democrats stand ready to work with you because now's the time for us to come together. You know, elections are always a uh, restart button. It allows us to refresh, and it allows us to start anew. 
And of course, there are going to be times that we're going to agree in this house, and there'll be times that we will be vociferously disagreeing. But I think that we will all remember that we are here to serve all the people of New York. I want to also congratulate the governor for his leadership and, of course, on his reelection, and let him know that we are working, we are looking forward to working uh, with him as well to continue moving New York forward. So many of us here were uh, in Manhattan yesterday and heard his tribute to his father. I think all of us could agree that the words were truly inspiring. So on behalf of the Senate Democrats, I want to again pass our condolences to the governor and to his entire family for their loss. Governor Cuomo, Mario Cuomo, was a great man. He was a great governor. His leadership, his vision and ideals are what we all strive toward. And as we take a memory, as we take a moment to embrace the memory of this iconic governor, let us do more than remember him, but let us look towards his example as we move forward this legislative session. Sadly, for too many fellow New Yorkers, the two cities that Governor Cuomo so eloquently spoke of in 1984 still exist today. But we have an opportunity to finally unite them. We can work towards making a more just and fair society, a society that provides jobs and opportunities to all New Yorkers, a society that deals with crushing income inequality, a society where everyone has an equal education, where it doesn't matter if you're from Elmira or New York City or even my hometown, Yonkers. You're given a shot at the American dream. I hope this session will be about making that American dream a reality for all New Yorkers. And to that end, obviously, we have a lot of work to do. It's been an extremely difficult period. I know over the past few weeks, we uh, had our attention gripped by cases on a national level, locally, the Garner case. And then, of course, we were faced with the, the tragic um, event that took from us Detective Lou and Officer Ramos. So to ensure that we provide those protections, we have to come together and get to work. We have to protect our law enforcement. And at the same time, we have an opportunity to make real reforms in our criminal justice system so that everybody feels equal access to justice. We have a tremendous responsibility and we have work to do. We have to, as I said, combat income inequality. And one way to do that is to really raise the minimum age, to wage the minimum wage to help lift over a million New Yorkers out of bone crushing poverty. And now also, it's time for a major rehaul of our outdated ethics laws, including public financing on campaigns. We can make Albany an example of good government. We also still have to stand up for health and equality for the women in New York. We can pass a full Women's Equality Act. And again, to my Republican colleagues, remember that the reproductive rights that were first addressed in this chamber was under Republican leadership. And in 1970, 12 of your party were able to help Democrats pass it. We have to continue to stand up for women. We also have to help those struggling with addiction, including the horrible heroin scourge that's devastating communities across the state. We have to ensure that all New York children have access to quality education 
that they deserve and that all of our children have access on a higher level for higher education to quality and affordable education. We have to make sure in terms of housing that every New Yorker has a roof over their head, place to call home. We have to extend and strengthen our rent control laws. And finally, obviously, we will be dealing with the surplus settlement funds. And we've got to do that clearly in a responsible manner that will help set New York on an even brighter path. Since so much money of this is from housing settlements, it's crucial that we use it to help create more affordable housing across the state. We also need to protect and expand our infrastructure, including our greatest infrastructure project going on now, the Tappan Zee Bridge, as well as the other roads and bridges that will, as well, we have to start to fix our crumbling schools. We could do all this while at the same time providing relief to local communities and creating jobs across the state. <laughs> Senator Skelos, as I said, the Democratic Conference stands ready to help you and to help you, Senator Klein. And as I said before, we will support you when we agree, we'll challenge you when we disagree, but we will not allow partisan bickering to obstruct our efforts to serve our constituents, and together we will give all New Yorkers the responsible and productive government they deserve. Thank you very much. Senator Libis. Well, I'm the uh, leader of the Independent Democratic Conference, uh, Senator Jeff Klein. Senator Klein. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you all. It's uh, great to be back in another session. I want to congratulate uh, Leader Cousins and, of course, uh, Leader Skelos. Uh, but while we come together today, today to embark on another very important legislative session, I want to first acknowledge a tremendous loss uh, that our governor and his family are enduring at this very moment. Uh, I know I speak for all of us uh, when I extend my deepest condolences uh, and prayers to Matilda Cuomo, Governor Cuomo, and the entire Cuomo family. While former Governor Mario Cuomo may no longer be with us, his spirit and legacy will surround us always. Uh, I know myself, when I was first entering public service uh, in the 90s, uh, Mario Cuomo was uh, my democratic touchstone. Uh, his eloquence, authenticity, candor, and intellect were a constant inspiration and example of how to work hard to do better and make a difference in the lives of New Yorkers. His grand presence will be sorely missed, and perhaps one of the greatest tributes we can offer is to remain committed to his spirit of common sense, getting the job done, and governing on behalf of all New Yorkers. It is clear that we are given a call to action. Uh, elections do mean something, and I think uh, the voters have spoken loud and clear uh, that once again, uh, they want us to work together in a bipartisan fashion uh, to get things done. Uh, we uh, try to elect uh, our respective party members during elections, but when the dust settles on that election, uh, it's time for us to govern. Uh, it is now, again, our time uh, to get things done. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, Senate President, uh, Senator Dean Skelos, and congratulate him. Uh, your continuing commitment to governing in a positive, productive, cooperative manner uh, is something uh, that I hold near and dear. Uh, we've accomplished a lot together uh, in the previous uh, four years, and I know that co cooperation uh, and bipartisan and under your great leadership uh, will continue. As, as a conference, uh, we have always stood uh, for getting things done in the Independent Democratic Conference, and certainly uh, I couldn't have done it uh, without the members of our Independent Democratic Conference. Uh, Senator Savino, Valeski, Carlucci, and Avella, who are among the most hardest working, steadfast, talented, and smartest public servants I have ever known. As a conference, we have always made it very clear that we answer to no one except our constituents. And I know I speak for all of us in the IDC when I say a huge and heartfelt thank you to the citizens of the Bronx, Westchester, Staten Island, Syracuse, Brooklyn, Rockland County, and Queens for once again renewing your faith in all of us. Uh, this year will be no different than the past four as we work together to, real, to really deliver real results uh, for all New Yorkers. 
Working with Governor Andrew Cuomo and our colleagues on both sides of the aisle, we are ready to roll up our sleeves and get the job done. As we follow the spirit and tradition of great governors in our state, like Roosevelt, Cuomo, Dewey, and Rockefeller, the IDC pledges to ensure that we are taking care of the many and not just the few. First and foremost, that means focusing on creating not just more jobs for New Yorkers, uh, but good paying jobs. I think everyone knows that in the 1930s, in the immediate wake of the Great Depression, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt set the country on a bold and ambitious course known as the New Deal. The programs enacted under the New Deal provided not just relief and recovery for millions of Americans, but created a foundation that served to reform the American financial system and put this country on solid ground for generations to come. The principles behind it was very simple, a belief that the people of this country are its greatest resource, and that investing in the worker builds a more robust and truly sustainable economy. We believe the same idea and type of program are possible today to New Yorkers who want to work once again. Uh, that is why the IDC has proposed a robust agenda, uh, which we're calling a New Deal for New York, where the $5 million in restitution monies from financial institutions who committed, committed various financial crimes against the hardworking people of the state will now go back to them in the form of new jobs, but good paying jobs as well. The people of this state deserve to see it repaid in a way that works for them. The program has two components. First, a program aimed at creating jobs through large infrastructure projects, such as roads, bridges, rail, transit, water, sewer, and parks projects. And the second component, a program aimed at reconnecting marginalized workers with good paying jobs. The bottom line is that we know the best way to solve income inequality is by giving business the incentive to create jobs through tax credits, but not just create jobs, create good paying jobs. And this year, we can set New York on a course to do just that. We'll invest in New York and the New York worker by ensuring fair wages for hard work. We'll also invest in New York families. That means making sure we are creating the conditions to support and sustain strong, hardworking families. It means we invest in affordable, quality childcare and paid family leave. To New York should never have, a New Yorker should never have to choose between where their heart is telling them what to do and what their bank account allows them to do. In today's world, with both parents working outside the home, this is the type of leave that is meaningful and makes a difference. It means making sure that we continue to invest in educational opportunities across the state for our youngest citizens, and that we help students and families tackle the rising cost of tuition and that every growing burden of student loans. Being in debt for the rest of your life should not be a prerequisite of getting a college education. And we need to renew our investment in housing in New York, focus on revitalizing existing public housing, and build new middle-class housing. We're here for one simple reason. We work for New Yorkers. There is a lot on the table this year, and to my colleagues in the chamber, Governor Cuomo, I think we have to prove in this legislative session that once again, we can continue a period of stability and sensible and smart governing that works for all New Yorkers and keeps New York moving forward again. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Klein. Senator Libis. Uh, Mr. President, I believe the uh, members of the Assembly are before the House for an announcement. Chair is here to acknowledge that members of the Assembly, Assembly Ways and Means Chairman Denny Farrell and Assemblyman Oaks are both present. We are here to inform the Senate that the Assembly is organized and is convened for the 2015 legislative session. Thank you, Assemblyman Oaks and Assemblyman Farrell. It's so denoted in the record. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. At this time, would you please call on the Majority Leader and the Temporary President of the New York State Senate, Senator Dean Skelos. Chair calls on Senator Skelos. Thank you very much, Mr. President. If I could, I'd like uh, all of us to pause uh, in a moment of re reflection and a prayer for our former Governor, uh, Mario Cuomo. So if we could just rise. I'd ask all to please rise. 
in a moment of silent reflection and prayer on behalf of former Governor Mario Cuomo. Senator Skelos. Thank you, Mr. President. At the um, appropriate time, we will be passing a, a resolution uh, commemorating his life, his public accomplishments, and then we'll all have an opportunity uh, to speak, if we wish, about our reflections concerning uh, Mario Cuomo. I want to start off by thanking Judge Lipman. I'm not sure if he's still here. Uh, he swore in an awful lot of people in a very short period of time. But uh, Judge, if you are still here, we, uh, we thank you very much. And I want to thank Senator Young uh, for uh, nominating me and for the support that I've received from our Republican conference. And uh, congratulate Senator Klein on his being elected leader of the Independent Democrat Conference. And to you, Senator Stewart Cousins, being uh, elected leader of the Democrat Conference. The, um, I'd like to introduce some of uh, our new members. Uh, Senator Klein mentioned before that um, after an election, the people have made their decisions and the people spoke. And I'm very proud that of the 10 new members in this chamber, seven of them are Republicans and the people did speak. So let me, if I could start, introduce them. And it's not going to be long introductions, but I want to start off by uh, introducing Rob Ort. Rob is a uh, former North Tonawanda mayor, um, and quite frankly, a war hero, having served in Afghanistan, and now continuing his service to the people of this state. So we welcome you, Rob. Rich Funky, who has served his constituents in many different ways, uh, but as a news commentator for, for many years, uh, but even more important, uh, a charitable person. And I know both uh, you and your wife have done so much for different charities uh, in the Rochester area. So Rich, we welcome you to the State Senate. Thank you. George Amador. George, took a little time, <laughs> but you're here. And um, former assemblyman, small business owner, understands what we have to do as a legislative body and the state to uh, support our small businesses and grow our economy. So George, we welcome you to the State Senate. <laughs> Sue Serino, uh, Sue, local government official, uh, owns her own real estate company, again, a small business, and she's going to be an outstanding uh, addition to our state senate, and Sue, we welcome you. Thank you. <laughs> Murphy, you're next. Dr. Terrence Murphy, uh, chiropractor. And, uh, you know, certainly, if anybody will need a neck adjustment, he's, he's here. And depending on how things go, it depends on how your neck's adjusted. <laughs> but um, he is a great person, again, a chiropractor, doctor, small business owner, understands what small businesses go through, and is going to be part of that team that helps our small businesses throughout the state and to create jobs. So we welcome you, Tom. <laughs> Michael Venditto. Michael? Now, I'm very proud because he, he is from Nassau County, my home county. And um, for those of you who have seen pictures of me from the past, I was thin like that once. <laughs> It's amazing what 30 years does to you, Michael. But Michael is a, uh, a lawyer, a county legislator, former county legislator in Nassau County. Uh, I think his parents are here and wife, and 
son, uh, Andrew, and uh, we welcome you to the State Senate, Michael. And uh, finally, from Suffolk County, Tom Croce. Tom, we, uh, we welcome you, former Islip Town Supervisor, and uh, again, a, a war hero, uh, came back from Afghanistan and um, served his country on, I think, several tours of duty, and uh, public service in Islip, and now public service to the people of the state of New York. Tom, we honor you, as we do, Rob, the service to our country. God bless you, and welcome to the Senate. Now, I want to, um, I mentioned, Kathy, thank you uh, for nominating me, and uh, for those of us who have been here uh, a number of years and have a number of uh, uh, terms under our belt, uh, welcome back to all of us, and I look forward to working productively with this entire Senate family, and it is a family. My friends and family that are here, um, Senator Squadron, I, they didn't leave um, listening to you. They're, just, they're trying to get back a little early. But um, I could not be successful without the support of my, my friends from my Rockville Center and other communities who have made uh, my election and re-election over the years possible. So I thank all of you for being here today. And to my family that's here, and in particular, I want to uh, acknowledge my father, uh, he will be 94 in March, and um, he, um, his goal is to be acknowledged by Wilbur Scott on uh, NBC one day when he when he hits 100, uh, and then of course when he's 99 he's going to want a few more. But but Dad, thank you for being my father and for the, the, the role model you've been for your entire family. Thank you, Dad. <laughs> My wife, Gail, who um, has been a true partner and has worked closely with me. And, uh, you know, certainly the advice that she gives me many times is right on as of against the advice I give myself. So she's generally right, but my wife, Gail. My son Adam, uh, who's here, I mentioned to Michael uh, Vendito, Senator Vendito, before when he was holding his son. Uh, I remember holding uh, Adam when I was first sworn in. Uh, my family here, uh, my mom uh, held the Bible, and I held Adam, and he put his hand over my mouth and said, stop talking. So uh, <laughs> I've learned from him not to uh, talk that much, but even more important, uh, he's given me two beautiful grandsons, uh, Dean and Dylan, and uh, they are not feeling well. So uh, Ann uh, stayed home with the kids, but uh, they will be here in two years. So Adam, I love you too. <laughs> My entire family that's here, I thank you for being here and, and supporting me over the years, and certainly for the confidence that you've placed in me, all of you. Uh, today we open another legislative session, and the people of New York turn their eyes once again to Albany. By working in a bipartisan fashion, we've ended the dysfunction and made real progress for the residents of this state. We've passed four consecutive on-time budgets. And that is an incredible uh, accomplishment. And I want to thank my partner, Jeff, for being such an integral part of making that happen. And for all the members of this chamber, we've brought spending under control. We've enacted a property tax cap and continue to improve New York's economy. Despite the progress we've made, there's a lot more to be done. This year, our Republican majority will keep the focus where it should be on the economic challenges facing hardworking taxpayers and their families. 
We need to encourage the private sector to create new jobs. People in this state are looking for opportunity. They're looking for a hand up, not a hand down. And that's what I truly believe. Good paying jobs, and we will work together to help create them. We need to further reduce taxes, and we need to make it more affordable to live, work, and to retire here in New York State. I thank you for your commitment to serve the people of this state. Welcome back. Let us endeavor to work across the aisle and make this session our best session ever. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Scalzo. Senator Libis. Mr. President, is there any further business at the desk? There is no further business before the desk. Mr. President, there being no further business, I move that the Senate adjourn until Monday, January 12th at 3 p.m., intervening days being legislative days. On motion, the Senate will stand adjourned until Monday, January 12th at 3 p.m., okay, intervening days being legislative days. The Senate is adjourned.